Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, CNN fires a senior journalist over a Twitter comment and the storm that comment provoked. Mourning the death of a Shiite cleric classified as a terrorist by the U.S. Against the odds, Google and China are still doing business. The Russian magazine and website that won't accept just anybody, it's called Snob. And the stop motion video that puts the animation into graffiti. It has grown into the social network of choice for political demonstrators, celebrities, even world leaders. But for CNN's former senior Middle East editor, Octavia Nasser, updating her Twitter feed proved to be a career ender. Ms. Nasser used Twitter to pay her respects to the Grand Ayatollah Mohammed Hussein Fadlallah, a prominent Lebanese Shia leader who recently passed away. Sheikh Fadlallah was a complex figure in the Islamic world. He was considered a voice of moderation, known for defending the rights of Muslim women. But he was also an avowed enemy of Israel, and in the United States, his ties to Hezbollah made him a wanted man. By firing Octavia Nasser over her tweet, CNN opened itself up to criticism and renewed charges that although it is a network with a global reach, it remains at its editorial heart an American news outlet that often toes the political line and is particularly sensitive to criticism by the pro-Israel lobby. Our starting point this week is the nexus between cyberspace and the mainstream news media, the perils of Twitter's side, and the growing lack of tolerance for nuance in the reporting of certain stories in the U.S. media. A message on networking site Twitter has cost a longtime CNN employee her job. Octavia Nasser said something that offended the wrong people, and that's what got her fired. So is the liberal media not so liberal after all? It is such an, an, an egregious, a blatant case of hypocrisy and, and double standards. She posted a message on her Twitter account mourning the death of a Shiite cleric classified as a terrorist by the U.S. There have been a lot of people who say, what, this is just ridiculous. People who demonstrated, remember... The, the case against Octavia Nasser, a Lebanese-born journalist who had been with CNN for 20 years, started with this Twitter message. Sad to hear of the passing of Syed Mohammed Hussein Fadlallah, one of Hezbollah's giants I respect a lot. I think the cautionary tale here is that she said exactly the kind of thing that you can't say in American media and paid the, the price for it. That's the lesson. The lesson isn't that Twitter doesn't allow you time to write a long message. We know that. It's what kind of message you're writing. People like HonestReporting.com, a group dedicated, it says, to defending Israel against prejudice in the media. It asked, is Nasser a Hezbollah sympathizer? The journalist quickly blogged that her short tweet was a mistake, that she did not respect the cleric's support for suicide attacks against Israeli citizens, or his view that the number of Jews killed in World War II had been inflated. But, as she explained, Fadlala took a contrarian and pioneering stand among Shia clerics on women's rights. He called for the abolition of the tribal system of honor killing. He warned Muslim men that abuse of women was against Islam. The blog offered the kind of nuanced explanation that Nasser's Twitter message lacked. But by this time, Fox News and other right-wing and pro-Israel organizations were on the story. In America, there is a very well-organized and very well-funded attack machine on the right that constantly goes after the media on the pretense that the media is too liberal and is too sympathetic to America's enemies. The problem is that, financially speaking, these large organizations are in some trouble. Uh, they have been for a long time, so they are especially sensitive to these kinds of charges of bias uh, wherever they come from. Reformist supporters took to the streets. Demanded so CNN fired Nasser. The network, which refused our interview request, issued a statement. We have decided that she will be leaving the company. She fully accepts that she should not have made such a simplistic comment without any context whatsoever. We believe that her credibility in her position has been compromised. I don't think anyone that is in the region would find what she said particularly surprising or particularly shocking or troubling. I do think that what CNN meant is that they have a credibility problem with certain American institutions or political figures, uh, getting back to this idea of the Israel lobby. That's the credibility problem that CNN's talking about. I would be careful about making this an issue just about Israel. This has to do more with a faction in the United States uh, that is very committed to this notion of a, a war of civilizations. They're just not inclined to see someone like Sayyid Fadlullah as a complicated figure. 
which he clearly was, and that was Ms. Nasser's real sin, was offering this picture of uh, Saeed Fadlullah that, uh, that recognized that he was a complicated figure. This is part of the, the problem with American media, the inability of the United States media to deal with the nuances of realities in our region here in the Arab world, where you can look at somebody like Fadlullah and say 99% of what he did was extraordinarily humanitarian. And one dimension of his life was that he also supported the resistance against the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon. And in the mainstream American media, that disqualifies him. Another nuanced aspect to this story, one that clearly made no difference to CNN, is that Fadlala had many admirers outside Lebanon, including some prominent figures in Baghdad. The Iraqi government is, is in large part formed by many of Ayatollah Fadlullah's followers, including Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, who went to Lebanon to uh, pay his respects uh, to Saeed Fadlullah. So the, the irony here is that for many on the American right, they support the Iraq war, but when a journalist like Ms. Nasser expresses some measure of respect for Fadlullah, that's just unacceptable. We're at the international desk. This is the place CNN calls the itself world. a global news network, but is based now, in the U.S and has been criticized before for caving under the pressure of the pro-Israel lobby. Here's one example. Gilo is an illegal Israeli settlement in Jerusalem. CNN used to call it that. The Israel lobby complained. Now CNN calls Gilo a disputed neighborhood. APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, is the most influential pro-Israel lobby group in Washington. To remove Hamas from its control of Gaza. CNN's lead political anchor is Wolf Blitzer. He used to work for AIPAC. Wolf Blitzer's history with AIPAC hardly ever comes up. If you can imagine a counterexample, uh, someone like Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, someone of his stature, having worked previously at uh, the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee or some comparable organization, that would be something that would come up quite often. It's a curious standard and one that leads you to wonder what the rules are exactly in this realm. One of the journalistic rules on possible conflicts of interest is to disclose everything. CNN's website has an extensive bio of Wolf Blitzer that goes back to his first job with Reuters, but there is no mention of Blitzer's work with AIPAC. Not a word. What rankles people in the Middle East about this story is what they call the double standard. They remember those Danish cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad that upset so many Muslims in 2006, but were defended by Westerners who said Arabs and Muslims had so much to learn about freedom of expression, about journalism. You know, when the Reuters or the Thompson Foundation or the Wall Street Journal or any of these Western groups from the US or Europe or anywhere come to this region and say, we want to help you uh, with freedom of the press and to train your journalists, uh, we'll say, well, why don't you go run a training program for CNN first uh, and then come back and train us. That's the idea. The idea was... One final point on Octavia Nasser. The journalist accused of sympathizing with Islamic extremists isn't even a Muslim. She's a Lebanese Christian who happened to care about Muslim women and admired a cleric who tried to help them. It cost her her job. And here's how our Global Village voices see the firing of Octavia Nasser. The firing of Octavia Nasser certainly seems unjustified, especially after so many years of complying with CNN's agenda for covering the Middle East. She was only expressing sympathy for the death of a leading spiritual figure, one who had close ties to the highest members of the Iraqi government, supported by the United States. From the other side, it certainly seems to have been a knee-jerk reaction. And the most worrying thing for me is that if you're prepared to sack someone with 20 years experience and lose that experience from your organization, because you're afraid of some short-term bad publicity, um, then that's worrying for the future of journalism. You know, we have to separate the activity of doing journalism with the appearance of objectivity. I believe that somebody can be fired for expressing an emotion of the moment is really outrageous. And not only is it outrageous, but the fact that she is the second highest, second highest ranking American Arab journalist to lose her job uh, over comments that were never intended uh, but were uh, casual. That is a frightening situation, I think, here in the United States.
If you've got an opinion on the way news is covered that you'd like to get on the air as one of our Global Village Voices, Facebook and Twitter are the best ways for you to go. We've now got over 4,000 fans on Facebook. Many of them go there to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in with an opinion on the media. Or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're at listening post at aljazeera.net. Time now for some Listening Post news bites. As one web analyst put it, Google's odd dance with China and the authorities there continues. Google has had its operating license for China renewed for another year. This comes after the company pulled out of mainland China in January, complaining about censorship and a cyber attack that it blamed on the Chinese government. Since then, Google has redirected its Chinese users to its servers in Hong Kong. But the government didn't like the automatic redirect, so Google had to change that, requiring Chinese users to click through to the Hong Kong site. Now, if these rules sound a little bit unclear, that's because they are. Google's co-founder, Sergey Brin, has talked about a lack of clarity. And as recently as a few weeks ago, Google's top lawyer sounded pessimistic about the prospects of a license renewal, so even the company was surprised when it happened. Earlier this year, when Rupert Murdoch's News Corp bought a 9% stake in the Saudi-owned Rotana Media Group, many analysts wondered what the alliance was up to. Now they have their answer. Murdoch and his Saudi partner, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, plan to launch a 24-hour Arabic television news channel that the prince says will offer an alternative to Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. Rotana has also announced that the channel will be run by Jamal Khashoggi, the former editor-in-chief of Al Watan, one of Saudi Arabia's more progressive newspapers. It's going to be interesting to see if Khashoggi will be given the editorial independence from Rotana that published reports have said that he has been promised, given that the channel says it will be reporting on Saudi issues and is being bankrolled by a member of the royal family. But money shouldn't be a problem, although the prince is said to have seen his fortune dwindle, Forbes magazine still calls him the 19th richest person in the world with a net worth of just under $20 billion. French President Nicolas Sarkozy has made a habit of trying to exercise control over television and newspapers. Now he might want to turn his attention to the World Wide Web. Sarkozy is fighting allegations that came to light on a site called Mediapad, that he accepted an illegal donation of 150,000 euros from the heiress to the L'Oréal fortune, Liliane Bettencourt. The story has become a sensation in France and has been covered extensively in the mainstream media. Mediapar is an interesting site. It was formed by four former journalists from one of France's best-known newspapers, Le Monde. The site runs no advertising and relies on charging subscribers around $10 per month. Mediapart says this story has boosted its subscription numbers, and the site now predicts it will do what few news sites do. It will be profitable by 2012. The new coalition government in the UK is following in the baby steps of the former Labour government. It's pledging to reform Britain's archaic and punitive libel laws. Lord McNally, the new justice minister, says more consultations are needed, but the country can expect to see new legislation early in 2011 that he says will protect freedom of expression. British libel laws are popular with celebrities, oil companies, just about anybody with a lot of money and a reputation to defend. Journalists, academics and scientists have all complained that even if their work is focused elsewhere or published overseas, cases are often brought against them in Britain because the existing libel laws are tilted against freedom of expression. They'll welcome this new law, but they wish that the government would just hurry up. We're back after the break with a piece on where some Russian gazillionaires like to go online. Welcome back. The success of social networks like Facebook, MySpace and Twitter is often put down to their egalitarian principles. Anybody can join them and then they can hook up with people and communities online. However, here's a story about a site in Russia that's taking the opposite approach. It's called Snob and only the wealthy need to log on. Snob puts its prospective members through a rigorous selection process before they can gain entry. The Listening Post's Simon Ostrovsky now on the online phenomenon invented by a billionaire and the rich and famous Russians who are vying to sign up. You might expect the richest man in Russia to be a bit snobbish. But Mikhail Prokhorov, recently pronounced the country's wealthiest oligarch, has taken the concept to another level. 
Last year, the man better known for making billions in metallurgy and for run-ins with French police over alleged liaisons with call girls in a ski resort created a website for the very select few called snob.ru. It's a kind of Facebook for Moscow's Beau Monde. But unlike Facebook, members can't just create a profile and start sharing with friends. Mikhail Prokhorov's hand-picked editorial team choose you to be a member. That is, if you live up to the website's high standards. I'm a regular journalist. I wanted to find out just what it takes to become a member. I managed to slip into the snob office, and I asked the director if I would qualify. In order for a regular journalist to get an invitation to become a member of the club from us, he can't just be regular. <laughs> Members are progressive, successful people who are self-made, educated and cultured. And as a result of all this, they're also wealthy. As the nation's most eligible bachelor, snob owner Prokhorov is one of the most talked about people in the Russian media. Prokhorov claims he doesn't know how much money he has. But Russia's finance magazine estimates he's worth 14 billion dollars. He's also probably the only Russian industrialist who regularly updates a blog. Prokhorov came out on top of the Russian rich list after he managed to sell most of his assets, just before the financial markets in Russia plummeted last year. One of the assets Prokhorov kept was the Jivy Publishing House, which has a number of entertainment publications, including Snob Magazine and the Snob website. But none of his media are the serious political publications you'd expect a proper media mogul to own. So why Snob? I still think of Snob as a toy. It's a good toy. It's a beautiful toy. I think the, the design of the paper magazine is gorgeous, very, very interesting. Uh, but it is not quite clear what the purpose of this publication is. It certainly is not to, um, to have a political impact. I still wasn't clear what the whole snob thing was about. Was it a club for the very rich or just the very cool? I decided to meet a couple of members to see what they thought of my chances to get in. Anton Nosik is known as the godfather of the Russian internet because he's created so many news websites. When I first heard about the idea of snob, I, I hated it. Russia has done a great job uh, building a rift between the, the poor guys and the rich guys. And there is absolutely no point in stressing the rift now. When I saw the thing implemented, I saw it was not, uh, not boasting about your wealth. It is a good club with uh, extremely decent participants who are not there because of their wealth, mm -hmm. but rather because they are interesting people. The club is built with good taste. Interesting people, good taste, sounds like the club for me. But every new member needs two people to vouch for them to get in. Most people, I suppose, are too proud to come and beg for an invitation. I'm not proud. Mm. So I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah sure. You, you, can, you can cite me as reference. Fantastic. Thank you very much. One down, one to go. Next on my short list of members was Masha Tsigal. She's a hip fashion designer, but Masha's better known for being a regular at all the best Moscow club nights and parties. Are you a snob? Probably. Yeah, I think I am. Let's be realist. Let's face it. <laughs> they invited me to the grand opening, and it was actually very, very good and cool selection of uh, Moscow people who are very talented in, uh, in the things which they are doing. And for me, I'm very proud to be there. It's a great honor, actually. Masha's social life sounded great. All I needed was her reference, and I was in. I really want to be a snob, too. And they told me that I need to find two people who would recommend me in order for me to become a snob. Oh, really? Do you think I'm good enough? Could you help me? I don't think you're snob enough, darling. You won't recommend me? Oh, we will recommend you. Thank God. I was so worried there. No, so no, no, no. You're very nice. I will recommend you. OK, thanks very much. I appreciate it. 
So mission accomplished? It's been a few weeks since Masha and Anton said they'd recommend me, but I haven't received any kind of invitation. Must be lost in the mail. I'm sure it's on the way. More Global Village Voices now on Snob. One thing we know about these elusive billionaires is they don't like a hassle. So why not create an invite-only virtual club like all the famous private clubs of yore, one that is only akin to Facebook the way caviar is akin to grilled sturgeon. On top, exclusive niche is one of the best established business models in online media. Target, service, commercialize. It's easy. I'm already working on an interactive Butler app. Finally, ever tried to create stop motion video? It can be a laborious, pain, pain, painstaking process. It takes time, time to edit. So we have nothing but respect for an artist who calls himself Blue. He's an Italian whose work we've featured here before, and his latest work mixes paint, pipes, buildings, and trash in a short, unscientific story about evolution. This video has jaws dropping all over the World Wide Web, so we've made it our video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.